Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I know it's a beautiful night. There's probably many other things you'd rather be doing, but we do uh, here at the Fishtown District appreciate you taking the time. Um, we'll talk about a, a subject that is certainly very important for the business, uh, business Improvement District, our residents, and the surrounding community, and that's the issue of parking. And this is certainly not a stranger to any of you who have participated before, uh, as this issue has at least gone back, uh, back to 2016. And what we're gonna do today is, uh, we're, we're fortunate to be joined by several officials of the Philadelphia Parking Authority, including Ann O'Neill, who will be kind of going through the most recent parking study that was done of the designated areas of Fishtown. But I wanted to go over a couple of ground rules and a little procedural background. Um, this is a series of three. Uh, we'll be having one next Wednesday and then the following Wednesday, the 28th. The goal is to make sure that we reach as many people as we can, um, both within the Business Improvement District and in the surrounding neighborhoods, as to what's on the table, what certainly recommendations are out there, and let you all weigh in. And in a way, we're going to run this like a city council hearing. Uh, we're going to present the facts to you, and then each of you will be, you know, raise your hand, will be giving two minutes for public comment. If there are any specific things that can, we can address immediately, we certainly will. Uh, besides the Philadelphia Parking Authority, we do have representatives uh, from the Streets Department and SEPTA here, uh, as well as uh, my wonderful friend, uh, Sean McMonagle from Councilman Scola's office. Um, so may, we want you everyone to understand that you will get to have your say and then some. Uh, we ask that each person will only get one period to comment today, but you're not precluded from coming back in the following weeks and speaking again and hopefully being able to digest a little bit of what we've said today. A little bit of background here, certainly the Fishtown Business Improvement District, I'm sorry, Fishtown Kensington Business Improvement District uh, started uh, December 12th of 2019. Uh, certainly when I took the job and Kay Anderson, our director of operations is with us, um, the issue of regulated parking and parking turnover, hi Kay, um, was a big issue. And one of the things certainly that we noticed and um, just from observation was, we're the only business improvement district and commercial corridor in the city and there are 18 bids that does not have any regulated parking whatsoever, meaning uh, portions of Frankfurt Avenue and Girard Avenue, which we're going to talk about today, is you can literally, if your car is legal, leave it on the street and it can remain there indefinitely. And what we learn and what we're going to talk a little bit about today is that lack of turnover has several adverse effects. Certainly, it depletes a very limited parking supply. It hurts businesses in that people that are going for dinner to shop, to stroll, whatever it may be, if they can't find a parking spot, they may leave and that's business lost. Or they may go park in the residential neighborhoods, which then takes away parking spaces for our residents. We don't want that either. So prior to us coming into existence back in 2016, the Philadelphia Parking Authority and working with New Kensington CDC and the newly created Fishtown Co. actually did a parking study of a portion of Frankfurt Avenue, basically the thousand block to through the 1400 block. And we'll go through that today about those recommendations for regulations. Um, and certainly when we came into effect, we began conversations with our stakeholders, um, Fishtown Neighbors Association, um, certainly the PPA and our elected officials to re-engage that. And we were looking for basically to find some sort of help on Frankfurt Avenue, really from Richmond Street down to about Jefferson or Master or Palmer and Girard Avenue, um, probably from Burks through Front Street would be ideal. Um, so approximately April or May of 2021, uh, the Philadelphia Parking Authority conducted a study of those requested areas um, for, the, for the sake of in implementing a pilot program, which would mean for eight months, we would start to have what would be the, what we hope would be the recommendations we're going to discuss tonight 
implemented. Uh, since then, the Fishtown bid, both before and after, had two public meetings. Uh, on February 19th of 2021, which was a full transportation meeting with streets, SEPTA, PennDOT, et cetera. And, then on, and that was a 3 p.m. afternoon meeting. Then on December 4th of 2021, we had an evening meeting at 6.30, where we again specifically addressed parking. As some time has passed, uh, we thought it best, be, and I know our elected officials felt the same, that we re-engage everybody here today. Uh, and that brings us to now. So again, you're all muted. So we're gonna be able to make a presentation to you. And then we'll, then we'll simply, I'll bring it up, tell you to put your hands up. We'll call on you. Our timekeeper at the bell is Kay. So she will monitor the two minutes. If there are any things that isn't addressed that you wanna reach me, feel free to email me at mark, M-A-R-C, at fishtownbid.org. And we're happy to get you, you know, any further responses that we can. Uh, we made sure to, in the also one more procedural thing, after we had our last uh, meeting in December of 2021, uh, we prepared and mailed out and put on social media a parking study to kind of pull together um, both resident and stakeholder positions about parking and, and their position on the recommendations. Uh, we'll briefly hit on that as well. All of those have been distributed. I know the star wrote two articles about the subject. So we're certainly feel confident that this issue is out there. Now, having said that, um, I'm gonna introduce Ann O'Neill, the Philadelphia Parking Authority. Uh, Randy, you, you can pull up the 2021 parking report or K, that would be great. And you still with us? Yep. Still I know my, my, my voice can sometimes knock people out, but thanks for the time. Yeah, no problem. So a little bit about the study in general before we get into some of the nitty gritty. When the, the Philadelphia Parking Authority is brought in to do something like this, what are some of the things that they're looking for in making formal findings and recommendations? So when we were asked to do this from the Fishtown Business Association, uh, we for the uh, Frankfurt Ave business card in Fishtown, um, we were looking at the, uh, we were analyzing the occupancy and the, the vacancy um, part of it because there are no regulations to really uh, kind of grasp, uh, like a, it, we did a comprehensive one and it was all for uh, occupancy and vacancy, like I said. Um, and what we do is, uh, each survey took place over the course of a four hour time frame. Uh, once every hour, an analyst would document each vehicle on the given location by individual parking spaces. They then returned one hour later, repeating until four, hour, four total passes were conducted within a four hour window for that location. Uh, surveys were conducted on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday during the three time frames, which was 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. and 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. 10 p.m. In a total, of nine surveys were conducted each day by the analyst. So right. uh, the area we surveyed uh, was area one, which was Frankfurt Avenue from Allen Street to Jefferson Street. And the second area was Gerard Avenue from Front Street to Marlboro uh, Street. Got it. In fact, if, if, Kay, if you could turn to the next page, it kind of breaks down. the. Are those the two areas there, Ann, that you're referring yes, to? that is correct, Mark. And so it looks like you did several studies per day on those weeks uh, that you were out there, which looks like, forgive me, I'm going to turn the pages back. Yep. Through April, April 27th of 2021 through May 15th. That is correct. That's when it concluded. Gotcha. And, and during your study, I know it looks like in the statistics part, you kind of broke it down into three separate parking categories, parking spaces, safety spaces, and courtesy spaces. Can you describe each briefly? So, uh, so the, um, the courtesy spaces are spaces at like uh, loading zones and um, like uh, package delivery zones, uh, et cetera, council zones and no park, well, safeties are no parking, so no stopping and zones like that. Got it. 
And, and tell me if I misstated when I spoke, because I know I had mentioned, I think you briefly mentioned that, you know, we don't have regulations here. So is it correct that if somebody's car is legal, meaning the tags, registration, et cetera, and they're in a legal parking spot, they can leave it there indefinitely. Am I right in saying that? They could. That is correct, Mark. Okay. Um, so in, in conducting the study, I know there was on page four, you kind of have a lot of abbreviations of terms. These are things that we find in the data, correct? Right. That is correct, Mark. All right. So let's jump ahead to the findings, which I think is why everybody was here. Um, and we just talked about the first line of that says, it's almost entirely uh, unregulated. So it would stand to reason there's a scarcity of open parking spaces available at any given time. Um, how do you guys judge that? Do you judge it by occupancy, turnover? How do you do that? Exactly. It's uh, occupancy and a turnover. It's both. So in looking at them, I guess on, the, on area one, the Frankfurt Avenue part, which uh -huh. basically basically looks like it goes up to about 1400 block of Frankfurt. Um, did you, were there any findings made regarding the occupancy or the consistency uh, percentage of cars remaining there? Yeah, it shows it, it shows it right there in the graph that you're showing right now that, you know, take 1000 Frankfurt Ave, it was 72% that was occupied and it, the vacancy was only 27%. Is there a number, and, I, and you have it also, so basically it looks like, you know, area one, it was 86% and Girard Avenue was 88. That was an average. Yep. Um, is there a number that the parking authority looks for in determining whether to recommend regulations that you'd like to see? And if there isn't, that's okay too. Pardon? I said, if there isn't, that's okay too. I mean, I guess it, it, it would be, deciding whether it's the business area and you you will want to see some turnover and, and you don't want it to be occupied the whole day sure and in fact when you go to By page seven people. um it actually you make it, it talks about the low turnover percentage Correct. that's what sort of stood out to us i mean you're talking 14 percent for frankfurt and 18 percent for gerard avenue would you characterize that as as low or concerning Yes, it's very, it's very low. So when, when looking at that over those two week, the two or three week span, um, I know after the next couple of pages, you make some charts, the parking authority makes some recommendations. Um, if we go to page 10. Yep. Um, and you don't have to read through that, but can you kind of briefly summarize both options that, that you threw out there? Yeah, so the one option was, um, to go ahead and install meter parking during the daytime that becomes residential permit parking in the evening and overnight hours for, uh, for instance, like the locations could be posted for two hour meter parking from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. or 10 p.m., whatever, you know, is decided upon. And then two hour residential permit parking from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. once again until 8 a.m. So it kind of gives it back to the residents overnight. Sure. Um, this would give the uh, patrons of the businesses easier access to parking during the day and residents would be able to take those spaces in the evening hours. Uh, this would be like the, um, we have regulations like this at um, Washington Ave, Washington and um, South Broad in South Philly. And um, it, seemed to, it seems to work there. Great. So that was one option. And the other option was uh, to go ahead and have uh, three hour meter parking from 8 a.m. until 12 a.m. and have residential permit parking override, which means any resident that has a valid residential permit parking may park in the zone without paying the meter. Sure. You, Qu question about the residential permit parking. First of all, sure. do you know the offhand what the cost may be for a resident? So for a resident, for um, an annual permit for their first vehicle, it would be $35. And for the second vehicle in the household, it would be 50 and for the third, it would be 75. And for four or more, it would be $100 for an annual permit. And, and for our residents that live here that may be interested in that, is there some sort of, what, what qualifications must or criteria must they meet to get that? So the vehicle must be registered to the uh, 
to the address they are requesting a permit from. So that's definitely that the vehicle needs to be registered to that, that particular location. And also you would have to show proof of residence, like your license or a, a water bill or any, any kind of utility bill. Sure. And can that be for anybody? So like could someone in a zip code like 19115 have that and still park here? So it would, yes. Yeah. So it, it depends on what boundary they're in. So in your area there, so that's where that part of Fishtown on that, on that side of the street, I guess it would be on the, um, on the north side of Gerard Ave, it would be District 25. Okay. And then on the um, south side, it would be District 10. So someone on the um, south side cannot purchase a District 25 sticker. Gotcha, understood. And one of the things, I don't know if we certainly in reviewing these recommendations, both our organization and the Fishtown Neighbors Association board had looked and we had made a joint recommendation for option two. In fact, having 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. With, with the residential. Does it have, does the PPA require, because I know we get this question all the time, would that automatically require kiosks to be installed or is a non-metered way of doing this? How does normally and what is best in your opinion? So the, so how it is on Washington. So I did go over to one for Washington Ave, Washington in South Philly, uh, broad in Washington. Uh, that's actually timing right around there. Okay. Timing so meaning a, a kiosk or a meter or? Pardon? You meaning a kiosk or a meter, or there's actually a, someone? No, no, there's no, there's no meter. There is no kiosk. It is just timing. They would time the vehicle for two hours. Gotcha. Okay, and so that's something we could do here for three hours. You could. Okay. Um, there's also recommendations regarding loaning zones. I don't think I need to tell everybody uh, on this call. In fact, I know I was speaking to the president of Fishtown Neighbors the other day, and. On Frankfurt Avenue, it always seems there's trucks stopped in the middle of the street. Right. So you and your office made a recommendation regarding adding loading zones, if you could describe that a little bit. So, so when they went ahead and they did the survey, they noticed the loading zones that were there, that uh, they were occupied at a rate of uh, approximately 50%. So that means they were, they were being used 50% of the time. So it means that you're getting more turnover. People are just coming in, especially for um, like placing a few outside of uh, businesses that are, you know, grab and go nature where you're just running in to pick something up and then going instead of being there the whole time or double parking and just running in. And that would be something that the individual businesses through work with us could submit to, to obtain? Yes. We can, we can actually give you an application for it so you can see it. We can send you a, an application for our loading zone program. Sure. And, one, and I know this may seem like a kind of obvious question, but I want to be clear. Uh, first sentence of the recommendations, I think, kind of say a lot, but it says, needless to say, some course of action needs to take place in the surveyed area to increase turnover and create a better parking environment overall. Can you kind of set forth why that was important to, to state and why it's important to accomplish? Well, I think from the uh, from the numbers, it's really showing you that it's it's being occupied by the same vehicles all day long. So if I mean the businesses aren't, you know, it's not the people who are uh, patronizing the businesses that are using those spots to go, you know, to go ahead, the, the occupancy rate is so high with the same vehicle. That's, that's, that's why we think there would be a need for some regulations. And that's why we made the recommendations that we did. Sure, and it, it certainly would stand to reason, um, uh, or certainly, let me ask you this way, having the L stop at Front and Girard, I'd imagine that would affect, could affect our parking situation as well. Oh, most definitely. And that's no offense to our folk friends at SEPTA, we love them. So, <laughs> um, but you know, people do come down and, and park here and go to work or go to Center City. And that's always a space that we miss. And I, one of the things I think that is, we wanted to stress is, you know, we want to also, obviously we 
want to take care of our businesses in the business improvement district, but we want to protect our residents, which is why we threw out there the parking permit. But certainly, it, it, and I know you got you guys didn't study it, but would it be an obvious conclusion that people would be parking in the surrounding neighborhoods too to visit the commercial corridor? Oh yes, if they don't find parking on Frankfurt Ave, they'll they'll park on Thompson Street or uh, Shack and Max. And I mean, I know, but I do know a lot of those blocks do have residential mm -hmm. permit parking, so they really can only stay so long on those blocks, also. Sure. Sure. Um, one thing and I don't know that was in here, but I know during our many discussions over the past few years that someone actually commented on one of the Facebook groups today, uh, there is actually a public parking lot, 1300 to 04 on Frankfurt Avenue. Actually, he's got a big municipal sign there, but it's basically 20 free spaces. I don't know if you were aware of that or saw that in, in, in the studies at all. Well, we didn't, we did not study the lot. Uh, we were just asked, we were just requested to do the on street. We weren't to do that. That kind of falls under all street, the lots, any of the municipal lots. Okay. Right. Cause it actually has a PPA sign on it, oddly enough, but it's there's a, no meters. It's free. Right. So that was one we were looking at. Could that be added to that? But we, we could certainly talk how best to look into that as well. I don't want to. Okay. Have you comment on something that you didn't look into? Right. Is there anything you want to add about that, that we should, that I may have missed that we need to really hone in on, on this 2021 report? Uh, I think we covered it all, Mark. I mean, I'm sure you're going to have some questions coming up, but. Well, that's okay. Yeah. And this is a question I don't know that you can answer. Obviously someone may ask, um, you know, this was during the pandemic at the time, and um, it's been, you know, it, we're in 2022 now. Is there anything, and I'm going to go through the 2016 thing to kind of answer this. Is there anything in your professional opinion that would lead you to think that it's improved that vastly that we wouldn't need regulations? Uh, I think, I think if you go by the 2016 versus the study we did, you're going to see that the occupancy rate was still kind of similar because like you, we already address SEPTA's right there. Uh, also, it's kind of pretty residential off the side streets. So um, yeah, I think, I think it would be the same. Awesome. Um, Kay, can you pull up the 2016 uh, report? And this was just for Frankfurt Avenue, correct, Dan? Yes. And it looks like it was the same boundaries that you used in the 2021 report. Yes, that's what we were requested to do. Okay. And if we can, I'll wait for that to kind of get up there. If you go to the next page, there we go, right there. This is a much briefer report. Did you have a chance to review this, Ann? Did I? Have, I went through it, yes. Okay. Um, it, it talks about the unregulated areas and the times when we need it. Um, Briefly, can you kind of looking and surmising at the report? Um, what does it say about Frankfurt Avenue and the days of the week that that, that seem to be at issue? I mean, it's it's still similar to the to the uh, survey we did in twenty twenty one that we uh, that we conducted then. I mean, it's it's pretty much saying the same same exact thing as far as occupancy and vacancy, you know, the vacancy uh, percentage. Sure. Um, in fact, you mean the first sentence says the same thing. It, there's a need to create parking regulations. Right. And then also it, we conducted the same exact, same exact way. We did the three hour park and like uh, we did the uh, four passes. So we conducted pretty much the same way as we did in 2021. Sure. And it looks like even it makes us makes a comment about motorcycle scooter zone on the eleven hundred block of Frankfurt Avenue. Right. Um, what is that? So that that would be a, like almost like a like you see for bikes something similar to that. So that that's for like motor scooters. Uh, the problem with that, if we if you were to do it without meters, you would need a kiosk machine for that. For that and particular, here, and that, that means that only motors at all times only motor scooters can park in that zone. And in looking to on, the, on this part of the study, and it says, 
it kind of goes through a little even more in some ways direct. It says parkings are parking over two or two to three hours or initial visit. Um, talks about taking parking on Frankfurt and taking public transportation. Um, and it actually says prospects to have available parking spaces for business customers are unattainable. So this was five years before the one you just went through. Correct, Mark. If, okay, if we could go to the recommendations page and next page. Yep. I know you're getting there. I'll give you a second to look at it because it kind of goes through and kind of breaks through the blocks a little bit. Right. So it, it, it pretty much is good. I mean, we went only because a lot of the, the bars and restaurants, we kind of, I mean, we're looking at it back then. It's, as you can see, it says 8 a.m. to 12 a.m. But if we really want to look at from the perspective of a resident, we probably would want them to go down a little earlier. Sure. Sure. Was it in, in, the, in the report from the thousand block to 1400 block, mm -hmm. was there any part of Frankfurt Avenue that, and I'll let you kind of read through and check the next page, yep. that seems to be the heaviest? Oh, my, yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, it it, it kind of is this, so similar to our 2021 survey. If we could go to the next page, Kay, I want to po point something out just because we were talking about that lot. This is the last page in the version that I have. Yeah, there should be one more. There's not anything after that? Oh. Well, what I'm looking here, we've actually posted this. Um, and then I'll, I'll read it to you because it talks about the 1300 block and that actually had a 95% occupancy rate on the street on Saturday and Thursday afternoon through the evening. And then it says this, there is a small PPA parking lot, which was occupied 100% of the time throughout the day. It is highly recommended for this lot to have parking restrictions. I think, they, I think at that time they were asking us to look at the uh, lot. Right. When we were requested to do this particular survey, they also asked us to look at the lot at, um, is it Frankfurt Avenue Thompson? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so I just wanted, because that was certainly something that was brought up and, and you, so I wanted to make sure we pulled that through. And then it looks like 1400 block also has a very high rate as well, which would make sense. Mm -hmm. So, so real briefly, and so to, you know, uh, we're going to let everybody sort of weigh in Surely, could you describe how the uh, pilot program works to start that and what and the introduction people would get or warning people would get if, if such regulations were implemented? So we would do steer clears. I mean, I'm sure Corinne or, or Linda can speak upon about that as far as, because that would be on the enforcement end, but what would happen is we would go ahead once the signs are placed and regulations go up, we would notify by putting steer clears, which would be, you know, uh, notices on people's vehicles stating that, you know, this block will start to be enforced in, in the coming days. So uh, that's how we would do it. And I'm sure if we were to do it, I, I'm sure you would make sure you get it out to the people uh, in your, you know, in your group to let them know that this is getting ready to take place as far as enforcement. And it's an eight month period to, to our it knowledge? It is eight months. You usually a, a pilot or trial period is eight months. And what happens at the conclusion of that pilot program? So I think it would have to be a record. You would have, I think uh, it would have to come from, you know, your group to say whether it's it's working for you, it's not working for you. We need to revisit uh, the regulation type, or we don't need it. I mean, that's we wouldn't say, hey, it's not working. We need to get rid of it. It would have to come from you know the community, which would be the residents and the business association. Right, and to make it permanent, an ordinance would need to be entered, introduced, yes. and approved. Correct. Yep. Gotcha. Yes. Um. 
Carrie, do you have the survey real fast? So I just real fast, thank you, Ann, for all that information. And um, Corinne, I know Linda is also here from the PPA. Appreciate you know you taking the time and going through the details. I know people have some comments, so if we can answer anything, we will hear. But we want to make sure everybody can kind of weigh in a little bit. But thank you again for that. You're welcome, Mark. So after we um, had this last study done, and I want to give uh, Kay Anderson new kudos because she really helped put this survey together. And again, we mailed it to our stakeholders. We posted it. I just want to kind of go through a little bit. Um, and I'm going to start a little bit at the end um, because it allowed everybody to weigh in on which option they preferred. Am I correct there, Kay? There you go. And from all the participants that participated, and we can make sure, even though we've sent this out, we can get anyone that's participating today copies of anything that we're displaying now. Uh, just email me again at mark, M A R C, at fishtownbid.org. Um, but it basically 72, almost 73% of the participants preferred the joint recommendations from the bid and Fishtown Neighbors Board, which was for three hours parking in those areas, those affected areas, from 8 a.m. looks like to 12 a.m. Um, with uh, residential permit override. But we might have done 2 a.m., but either way. Um, and, and it kind of breaks down people. There's basically um, more doing that. We're, here were some of the findings we found. More felt regulations should be brought in. There was actually, and we learned this during our last uh, meeting, uh, which is something the Business Improvement District is actively working on, alternative sources of transportation, I meaning especially bicycle transportation. And we took that to heart. Um, we began talking to both uh, Indigo Bike Share, um, and we're working, they're, they're going to be adding Indigo stations um, in 2023 that, if, for example, on Frankfurt Avenue, they want to go all the way up to Lehigh with installations and possibly on to Girard. So we're working with them on that. We'll have meetings for that. We're also working with the Clean Air Council to bring um, more uh, bicycle parking. Um, we actually filed a grant with the Penn Treaty Special Services District to get 40 such units to install. Um, and we're working with um, the Bicycle Coalition to see what other ways we can enhance that. What we really encourage and we're certainly happy to see with a lot of the upcoming development, which this district continues to grow, is a lot of them are looking to making sure that there are always bike bicycle parking stations as part of their design. So we are appreciative that they're looking into that. And I wanna, before I open it up to all of you, and thanks Kay for bringing that up, um, is we understand that this is in many ways a first step. Uh, we wish it could solve all of it, it doesn't. We also understand that um, you all may have some concerns. Um, and that's what these this session and these sessions are really for. Um, so with that, uh, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to ask you to put your hands up through the chat, through the functions on the Zoom. Uh, we will call on you one at a time and you have two minutes um, to make your comment. If there's anything that we can answer or any of our panelists, you know, and can answer, uh, we're happy to try to do that quickly. Uh, again, you get to testify once tonight, but then you can testify at each one thereafter. So with that, um, if you have comment, we'd, lo we'd love to hear from you. Pro, con, anything having to do with the, uh, what you just heard tonight. Chris DePinto, are you trying to go? Can we unmute Chris? There you How go. about that? Yeah, we got Good? you. Okay, yeah. All right, so um, I own a property and a business on Girard Avenue, um, 407 East Girard Avenue. And I drive in every day, and so does my worker. And we just park every day, and we take up two spots. Or one of us is running the shop, and there's one car there. And um, I don't know what my options are going to be in the future. Um, I don't have a residence in Philadelphia, so I don't know if I can get a permit. But we're both parking there, and we're serving the community. And I don't know how we get to 
park all day. You know, we're not taking up a spot and stealing it from someone who needs it. We actually need them too. So what are our options as far as workers and business owners? Um, and it's, it, it, or anyone from the PPA, can you direct, I know there is, because we had talked about this before, and I think it was probably one of the reasons, I know Chris had mentioned this a while ago when we first talked about it, was there like a, a business owner type permit? Permit, yeah. Yeah, Mark, there, unfortunately, we do not have a, um, a permit that uh, is for businesses. Understood. Um, so to, to achieve something like that, that would be legislative, correct? That would be correct, Mark. All right. So if there were not, just for, I, so Chris has a longstanding business at uh, Girard in Columbia. Um, and so one of his questions, so if we didn't have meters, would they simply just have to go and move the car if there were regulations implemented? That's correct. If, the, if they're on a regulated block and it's two hours or if it's a meter, they would have to keep feet in the meter. If I there is PS, people can re-up it, correct? That's correct. To last longer. Okay. So what, so what, Mark, hi, it's Corinne O'Connor. Hi, Corinne. I'm from the Philadelphia Department of Affairs. So yeah, it's just to add on to Ann's statement. If we, if the um, group were to choose that it's just a three hour signing with the RPP override, then the businesses would, it would be difficult if you were open that you would have to move after the three hours. If you decided to put in a kiosk, then yes, he could go on the meter up app and pay all day long or choose to keep paying at the kiosk. So that comes into play when you make the decision not to have any kiosk at all, because that would be that that would be that effect on that type of part. No, thank you, Linda. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thanks, Corinne. Thanks, Ann. And and Chris, that's why we want everyone to be able to want time in. We're going to, just so everybody knows, we're going to be sending this, all the recordings of all these meetings to besides the parking authority and, and the surrounding agencies, but also the elected officials. So we're going to have as big as we want to have as big a response as we can from everybody. So, Chris, thank you. And certainly, let's keep in contact so we can try to find some solutions because we want to look out for you as well. Uh, Rob Serrano, your two minutes are on. You may begin. Okay. Um, I live at 1200 block of Frankfurt Avenue, right in the heart of the corridor right there. And um, I'm concerned about. I just found about this. Found out about this meeting by accident. Um, I guess you said it was publicized. I didn't see where it was publicized, but um, I, I wish there was more of a conversation with the community, with the neighbors, with the residents that live here, to let them know what was going on. Because if I wasn't scrolling through uh, social media, I wouldn't have found out. And I have some people, like my mother, who's not on social media. She she didn't know about this. And she lives on Frankfurt Avenue. This would definitely affect her. She's right down the block in the 1200 block. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is um, I'm concerned about what Chris just brought up. If they go with the option of the metered parking, then what's the difference? That's just benefiting the businesses and really hurting the residents because they would have to re-up the meter to keep their car there. I would basically be paying to keep my car somewhere around here. Even in, I don't want to get a ticket just for parking and bringing my groceries. And I live at the 1200 block on a busy street here on Fishtown. I, I don't want to have to um, come out and then have someone writing me a ticket as I'm just trying to drop off my groceries or picking up my kids to take them to an event. Uh, the other thing that I noticed is there weren't that many people um, on this call. I mean, here we have 21, 21 people total. So it kind of lets me know that a lot of people aren't aware of this. Um, especially with the thousands of people that live here in Fishtown, you would think that more of an effort would have been made to, uh, to let people know. You said something about who are the stakeholders, stakeholders that you mailed uh, stuff to? Who are those stakeholders? Are they the businesses or the residents or a combination of both? That's so, what I was so, uh, How are we with this two minutes, by the way, Kay? 15 seconds. All right. Anything else, Robert? Before, I'm going to answer your questions, but... I guess the re-upping of the meter is the one thing I'm really uh, concerned about because that would definitely hurt the families that are here. So just so, and thank you, Robert. So to answer the issue about the meter, as a resident, you would be able to get a residential parking permit. 
which overrides the need for you to feed the meter. So you can park in that area, even if it's regulated, whether there's kiosks or not, and you would be able to park for free because you reside right there. Um, as, as far as notices for the meeting, this is something that's been going on um, besides well before I got here, uh, but this is at least the third public meeting that we have had. Um, so in, in the, in, in, as I mentioned earlier, there was February of 2021, there was December of 2021. The Star newspaper wrote at least two articles about it. And I know John Geating, who has his hands up, the president of the Fishtown Neighbors, uh, his organization spoke during it and circulated it. Um, as far as the survey that was mailed out, Robert, that was mailed out to bid members. So that's what we have the addresses of. And then we relied on the neighborhood associations and social media to not know about just this meeting, uh, but all the prior discussions uh, that we've had of this. So thanks so much. Uh, next, we have Greg Waldman. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Good, how about this yourself? Is uh, you know, just 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 Andy. Um, <laughs> this is Greg Waldman. Uh, I'm uh, the River Wars District Planner for uh, the Planning Commission. Um, I'm really uh, happy to see something, um, w whatever concept uh, is decided, uh, being done for Gerard Avenue and, and Frankfurt Avenue. Um, it's there's like um, I I bike. Uh, up Frankfurt Avenue, and I, I try not to bike down Gerard because of the trolley tracks, but uh, the double parking uh, pretty much reduces that to um, one lane that's operable. And also on Frankfurt Avenue, uh, there's, um, you know, lots of dangerous kind of uh, swerving to the, um, the lanes for the opposite traffic, uh, which is done by cars and bicycles and even uh, trucks. So um, I, I, uh, I guess I, I appreciate the, res the concern both from the resident uh, perspective and then also from the, um, the business owner. Um, I guess I uh, want to express a little bit of a concern of the residential per permit override. Um, I was just, I guess maybe uh, someone from the uh, PPA could weigh in on this. Um, what would, um, so that would pretty much mean, okay, so you can't leave your car overnight if you live outside of where the uh, residential parking is um, is permitted for to get to get a sticker. Uh, however, still uh, residents can take up those spaces, uh, meaning that they won't be open for, uh, for people going to um, the, the 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 businesses along those corridors, um, so I, I guess that that is one concern. So I was just wondering, I guess, if there's any kind of studies that look into uh, if you have an override, how will that increase the uh, turnover um, versus if there's no uh, residential park permit parking override. Um, uh, the other uh, question I have for PPA is if there have been any analysis of um, how, uh, I'm not sure if PPA has done it or if there's uh, other studies out there that PPA has, has researched um, into uh, the impact of increased turnover uh, facilitated by uh, kiosks on um, uh, business sales and how uh, that could if, if there's anything you know related to, okay, so if you're a business owner and they have to pay a meter for an entire day, would that be captured by the potential um, increased business from uh, greater turnover facilitated by the meters? So I guess those are the two questions I have. Um, not a parking expert, but uh, that's I know that there are some in the room. So um, hopefully there there can be uh, yeah, but we'll. Like okay, those are my questions. Well, you're a planning expert, Greg. That's close. Um, I want to try to recap the questions. Um, so you were asking about the impact of the permit versus the override versus not having it. 
Greg, am I right? So I, I, I guess like if there's a part, if a permanent parking override, um, like who's who's parking and leaving their cars on these business corridors? Um, are they people who don't live in the neighborhood that would not be able to get a residential parking permit? Or is this just something that they would have to obtain and then we would have a similar issue of uh, spaces that are occupied um, for uh, you know, all hours of the day because um, residents are, are parking there? Well, I'm, I'm gonna try to answer this and then Anne or Corinne can tell me if I'm dead wrong. So, so you have to be in a certain zone to be able to get the residential parking permit for this specific area. So if you have that, you can park and not feed it. I would believe that after, and I see Linda Bradley's there too. Hi, Linda. Um, I, I believe that when the parking regulations break, whether it's midnight to eight or two to eight, that anybody can park there. Am I saying so, that correctly? So if a, a resident, is entitled to park there if they have purchased and qualified to purchase a permit, which means they met the requirements such as um, living in the area, providing the proof of registration, so forth. So any resident who bears a permit on their plate would be allowed to park on that corner exempt of the time limit. Got it. If there's not a permit I, I, I guess how big is the area where that would be eligible for purchasing that? Uh, parking permit. So it's a district and um, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe on that side is district 10 or 25. So is that correct? For that, for that, for the, where the survey took place, it would be district 10, which is on the south side of Gerard Ave, and then district 25, which is the uh, north side of Gerard Ave, which goes from, uh, I don't have it right offhand, um, is it go from, it, I think it goes from Gerard to York Street. I'm pretty sure that would be part of the, part of the boundary would be York Street. Got it. So that, that's pretty much all of Fishtown. Yeah, it, it, I'll be very direct with you, Greg. And I think it's, it's, it's a great, it's a point worth discussing. As certainly looking at this from a very narrow view of a business corridor, we would have wanted option number one, ideally, because that's that ensures the most turnover. Having said that, we also understand that we don't live in a vacuum and we affect um, residents that surround here. Um, so like I said, and this is not ideal, that's part of it, but we also don't wanna punish, we wanna try to do something to create some turnover. Now, part of what I believe the pilot will do will show us if we went with the recommended option of option two, because I know John Geating is going to speak in a minute. That's going to show us what effects it may or may not have and is something more necessary after that. You had a second part of the question. I don't want to spend too long, but uh, I don't know if we okay. answered that, Greg. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think that answers the first question that I had. Um, I guess to sum up my second question is if there have been any either studies done by PPA or uh, observed the research about the impact of, um, of metered parking on uh, business uh, sales along commercial, in commercial areas. I'll defer to our experts if there were any. We did not do any. Uh, we did not do any studies as far as uh, you mean. I, I assume he's talking about uh, areas where they have meters where it's RPP override. Yeah, or if there's uh, no uh, e either that, or if there's no um, override for uh, residential permit parking. I guess I'm I'm just kind of interested in exploring uh, the, the uh, concern from um, uh, Mr. DePinto on uh, um, that, that he would have to pay a, um, 
a full day's worth of meter um, at his business. So would, would, would the turn, would the increase, I mean, this is all, I guess it is, if absent a observed study, I guess this is hypothetical and we could probably move on. But um, what I didn't we wanna... could do, Greg, maybe to make it easy, is we certainly could talk offline and talk with Chris, also with the Pintos, anyone else, about trying to find out specific things about that. Maybe that's the best way to do it. Because I, I don't think the PPA yeah, has good. such a study. I'd, I'd, I'd be, yeah, thank you. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, just uh, in closing, I would like to say that I'm uh, very supportive of. Um, exploring the need for additional loading zones. Thank you, Greg, appreciate you. Uh, Heather S has had her hand up for a while. So Heather, you're up. Heather, are you there? And we'll move on, we'll go back to see if she's up. John Geating, you're next. Hey, thanks, Mark, and thanks everybody for being here uh, tonight. Um, I'm John Geating. I'm the president of the Fishtown Neighbors Association, and um, we had uh, voted to endorse the uh, the proposal for the the three hour um, parking with with permit override and uh, you know re reasonable uh, evening hours. Um, our board had actually two two consecutive boards had uh, endorsed that position, and that's because of you know, real problems uh, that have arisen from, uh, you know, the, the lack of regulated parking uh, on the avenue. You know, we hear, as much as we hear about parking, which of course is, you know, an, an issue for, for lots of neighbors, it's been an issue for me, but um, we also hear about, you know, problems with, you know, people people just trying to cross the street, people trying to, um, you know, use the, the, the curb cuts that are, you know, often blocked by delivery drivers and uh, Uber drivers and, um, you know, I, I bike with my kids uh, on Frankfurt Ave all the time, and I'm always seeing, you know, cars double parked, delivery trucks double parked, you know, um, but, you know, just the other day, I brought it to Mark's attention and, and our representatives, um, you know, there was a, a truck unloading in the middle of Frankfurt Ave because there was nowhere on the, you know, in the legal parking zone for them to um, unload their wares. And right behind them was like a bus full of people, you know, trying, just trying to get to work in the morning. And so the lack of turnover there has been creating a lot of problems that, that we hear about all the time. And so, um, you know, we had had a few different uh, stipulations, um, you know, for uh, a plan that, that we'd be able to support. Um, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that whatever we did would not make overnight parking harder. Cause I know that's really the pain point for people, you know, during the day, it's a little easier that's to find. Um, then we wanted to create more parking availability on Frankfurt and Jordan, which I think this will. And we wanted to stop vehicles from uh, blocking curb cuts and crosswalks and parking on sidewalks, cut it down and double parking. And I think that does this too. So we've debated this for years. I think we need to move on. And I'm hoping that um, we can quickly move forward with the pilot here because um, there's crazy stuff happening on Frankfurt Ave and Jordan every single day and it's gotta stop. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, Paul Kimport. Hi, Mark. Hello, hey. Paul. Thanks. How you doing? Uh, so as a, uh, uh, my name is Paul Kimport and as a longtime um, Fishtown resident and business owner, I just want to thank everybody for participating, especially for the, uh, you know, the, the study and surveys from uh, the parking authority and everybody at the bid for trying to, you know, organize the community to, to, to get together and have a collective, you know, um, sort of approach to it. And so I, I really think it's important work. Uh, as long as I've been here, there's always been, uh, you know, discussion about parking. I mean, that's that lot down on Thompson. I mean, that was something that's way before I was even here. That was basically, you know, I think um, designed from the state representative um, to, to ameliorate some of the problems with, with people parking all day, going to, you know, take the, the L to work. So there's always been stuff. And I think uh, the, the, the community sort of visioning is going to be really important to make it work as best as we can you know, find ways and, you know, find models to do it. And I really appreciate the work that everybody's put into it and participation. And I'm really excited about, um, you know, trying to have a, a more accessible community. And uh, I think there's a lot of things for me, if there's any question in this outside of just wanting to voice my support of the, the surveys and, and all the work done is how safety could really play a part of 
making it a uh, more accessible community for me as somebody who likes to uh, cycle uh, around the community or to work and, and so on. I think it's something that I feel more people would choose if it was a safer um, you know, community in terms of the avenues and, and the space. And I feel just in general, I think um, vehicular safety and pedestrian safety and cyclist safety can make, I think, for a more accessible community, which, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, that maybe A, more people will, um, you know, uh, cycle um, as opposed to, you know, you know, avoiding it because of the danger. Uh, and other uh, things are that just a more attractive community if it feels safe and calm. So I, I wonder if there's any part of safety that plays into the survey, I guess is my question. <laughs> Is there, is there any way to, is there any analytic or any sort of data that, that relates to safety uh, or is that just a kind of a different type of study entirely? I'm guessing it probably is the latter, uh, but I'll let Corinne Ann or Linda kind of confirm that. Um, as far as uh, the safety, I would think that would, without any regulations, that would be more geared towards, I would think the streets department, because I know they did all those walkways, the, uh, Right, the crosswalks like around Thompson and Frankfurt Ave. So um, we wouldn't do anything as far as safeties unless regulations were placed. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. we would place like uh, corner clearances and, and like there would be no stopping and no parking. Right. St right Steve yeah. Lorenz of Streets, is there anything you might be able to add? Not to, not to put you on the spot. No, that's all right, Mark. Good evening, everybody. I'm Steve Lorenz. I'm the chief highway engineer for the streets department. Um, any type of safety study we would do, we would do in partnership with PennDOT. Frankfurt Avenue is a state highway, and we would try to work it into uh, either a capital improvement project or um, some sort of paving plan. I believe PennDOT is planning on paving Frankfurt Avenue in the next, within the next two or three years. Yeah. So two years. years. Okay. Um, I'm giving you a way out, Mark, by saying three. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that that would be uh, what we would do. Uh, if there's a specific location, we're happy to look at it. Uh, doing a whole corridor study would take a little bit more time to do, but that's something that we would be willing to work with uh, the Fishtown District on. Great. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate you as always. No problem, Mark. Uh, before we go, I, I know, well, let's go back to Heather S. Heather, are you there? I am here. Thank you. That's <laughs> so okay. We don't want to forget about you. <laughs> I've only been on Zoom for the last two and a half years and I can't uh, get into a meeting when I need to. But really, I just actually have a kind of simplistic kind of logistical question. You know, what's proposed really sounds quite reasonable to me, but sort of thinking about then how parking and cars will be shifted into neighborhoods. If neighbors are interested in applying for permits for those specific areas where they live that's not currently permitted, and I'm wondering if somebody from the PPA could share that process. Sure, good question. That's my Heather. question. Thank so, you. So what they would need to do, we have, uh, what we have is a, a, a residential permit parking petition, which uh, a person on the block would go ahead and circulate the petition on the particular block who's requesting uh, for residential permit parking. And um, what you would kind of say the times, the days, we always say if you could meet with all the residents and I always say to kind of maybe have like a, a block meeting amongst themselves because you know sometimes what works for me doesn't work for you as far as the hours and the days that you want it regulated. Um, but once that's done and you uh, receive 60% of the block in favor for residential permit parking, you would then turn it over to your council person and they would need to write a letter of approval uh, for their residential block, for the block to become uh, residential permit parking. And then uh, once we've received the approval and the circulation, we'll go ahead and review the permit, the uh, petition itself. And then uh, if everything is, is right, everything is good, we'll go ahead and uh, start the process of installing the signs and the regulations on the block. And uh, then we would go ahead and do uh, steer clears once the regulations are up. Once again, we would do steer clears for two weeks to let you know we're getting ready to enforce this block. Um, and then we would just start enforcing it. So that's, how, that's how a block becomes uh, residential permit parking. 
I hope that answers your question. It does. I'm just curious if the petition is something that is a standard form that we get from the PPA or it's something we create on correct. our own. Yes, okay. You could actually even send it us uh, if you wanted to send me an email or uh, call me and, and, and okay. um, let me know that you're interested. I would go ahead and send you a petition package, which has inside the petition package would have the petition and then it would have a Q&A in there so you can hand out to your um, your neighbors, so they can okay. read it before they go ahead and sign it. Or, and it also in the petition it says uh, if they're in favor. Or some people might not be in favor because we always try mm -hmm. to have people uh, geared them towards the make sure you knock on everyone's door. So even so, it just shows that you you really uh, try to get everyone on the block. They can you know they can sign it and say no, I'm not in favor for these regulations. Uh, I don't want residential permit parking. But uh, that's what's in the petition package. That's great. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Heather. Thanks, Anne. Anne, would, would you, I don't want to put you in the spot, mind providing your email for the group here? So then you no. are putting me on the spot. If not, no. they can house this. I, gotta, I can have them go through me. No, Joe, can you ready? <laughs> Fire away. It's A O'Neill, A O N E I L L, at phillipark.org. There you go. That was easy. Was. And again, and I, and I don't want to speak for Mr. Geating, but I know we've talked about it before. Both the Fishtown, Kensington area bid and FNA will be more than happy to assist any of our residents, neighbors in doing any of these things. So again, you can always reach out to me. That's Mark, M-A-R-C at fishtownbid.org. And I believe, John, it's president at fishtown.org. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, we're happy to help anybody get, you know, connected with their neighbors and um, walk through the process um, if need be. All right. And we have one last one. She she wants to talk, but didn't know how to put her hand up. So, uh, Janae Green, you're on. If you're still there. She must be doing, going once. Let me text her. Calling on you. <laughs> She's still here. But she might she might be doing some child rearing things. Yeah, to say I couldn't unmute her. Oh well, she could join us in the next two meetings. I don't want to hold everybody up. Um, and it certainly was a good dialogue here today. First, I want to thank uh Anne, Corinne, and Linda from the PPA uh for uh, she's she's there. She's trying to find. There we go. I found it. I found Atta it. Girl. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're our closer. Hi guys. I'm so sorry for that. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'm I'm Janae. Um, I don't specifically have a business on Frankfurt Avenue, but I do understand the parking situation, and um, I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing. Um, for that. Um, so thank you for that. But I will play devil's advocate for a second and wish that there was something that we could do for um, the business owners who do drive in. Um, I know that's something that's probably out of PPA's hands, but it, what do you think, Mark, would be our our process of of trying to get something done for, you know, people like Chris at DePinto or, you know, so what and we it's would, probably something that's something that we have to talk to council as a whole big to we do. Talk, we have our good friends and we won't put them on the spot now. We have our representatives from uh, Council President Clark's office as well as Council Member Squilla. So we could talk to them uh, because it would have to be a legislative thing. They would have to introduce legislation. So I know having done that job that there need to be discussions with the PPA, the law department on how best to do it, how to do that. Um, it's certainly something that we are happy to look into because again, we don't want to, we don't want to punish the people that we're trying to help. Um, right, so, right. So we'll certainly follow up with that, um, you know, for, in subsequent things. Um, but we want to make sure as we start that we're addressing what we can on the short term as well. Right. And that's, you know, in the same token, you know, I am a resident of, of our Fishtown area. Um, so my family and I, we walk up to Frankfurt Avenue often. 
So when it comes to like the safety, when it comes to the safety side of it, I, I totally agree. I really appreciate having the parking, even just running into some of the restaurants to grab something to eat, having the loading zone area is, is beneficial. So whatever we can do to have any sort of regulation, I'm for it. Let's see what we can do. So you did well. Good job, Janae. Thank <laughs> <Thanks>. you. <laughs> Uh, and with it, it looks like that's the last of the comments tonight. I want to thank again, uh, Ann, Corinne, and Linda from the PPA for not just their time and their information tonight, but uh, all their work on this subject. I know it's, it's not easy, and it's one of those issues that you just can't make everyone happy as much as we're going to try. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Steve Lorenz from the Department of Streets and uh, Wendy Green Harvey from SEPTA from being part of the meeting today, as well as uh, our friends, Venice Whitaker and Sean McMonagall from city council for always being there to help. Um, you know, I, I always wanted to part with this. I think one of the things we all can agree on, study or no study, we certainly from live, I live and work here and many of you do the same. Um, we certainly see that uh, the parking situation is a concern and we're only getting more commercial and residential density as we grow, which is a wonderful thing. So we need to find ways to again ensure uh, that our business people can visit our businesses and also not clog up our neighborhoods when they can't park here. And we're going to investigate all options to kind of protect our business owners who drive to work and do all those things so that people can come here. So uh, this was a great thing, and, and I think we. Uh, also, with the loaning zones, we could start to make, um, I think, at least a, a little bit of progress, or hopefully a lot of progress, in those very dense areas to start, um, to start turning over some cars and keeping things moving. I, I'm always, I'll leave you with this, I'm always reminded, uh, there was a post last year that I saw from some small town in Italy, where there was a car that had been parked legally, mind you, same situation as here parked for almost two decades in the same spot, never moved, couldn't be moved. Not and they literally just put a little monument statue around it. Um, while that's a funny story, sadly, that could be a true story here. And we don't think that's fair to anyone, resident, business owner, patron alike. Um, so hopefully, again, if you want to join us, we have two more to go. And again, please feel free to reach out to us offline. Uh, thank you all again. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Randy. If you two can stay on and everybody have a great night. Take care.